So, a few days ago, he had the news an Egyptian Rafale F3 managing to jam the radar, another Egyptian Suhoi 35, making it almost useless. A few years ago, we also had some news that the Russians in Syria, in their Kmenemim, they managed to defeat a drone attack electronically. And then there are, for example, those Typhoon pilots always saying that the Gripen is capable of getting very, very close, scaringly close when it's own electronic warfare suit. Uh, and do you remember? Do you remember those cases in the Baltic where the some Russian planes actually appeared nearby some American ships without having been identified by the, the SPI-1 raiders before, just appeared out of nowhere and nobody really knew how they did it. Oh, and, 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 and the, Australian, the Australian pilot, do you remember the Australian pilot saying that even within visual range was incapable of tracking the F-22 and shooting? Uh, yes, but at the same time, we all remember that picture where there was the F-22 just in the middle of the Rafale uh, head-up display. Yes, but still we have all those pilots that you're fighting against the F-22 or the F-35. They were really unable to understand where it was coming from. And I mean, many of them were actually F-15 pilots. So if A beats B and B beats C, but then C beats A, which one is the best? Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. And please stay with me till the end, because as usual, the stuff that we're going to cover here is not easily found anywhere else on YouTube. But maybe you can find it if you look attentively, but it's not very common. So, assessing military power before the industrial age was relatively easy because numbers, quantities were the driver. Obviously, the troops experience was extremely important, the training was extremely important, but the equipment, there are not that many cases where uh, an asymmetry in the equipment turns out to be uh, decisive for the outcome of, of a confrontation. There are some cases indeed, think uh, the British longbows, for example, during the 100 Years War, but there are not that many. When, after the Napoleonic Wars, the technology asymmetry became more and more relevant and everything became much more complicated. In World War II, obviously, quantity was still an important factor, an extremely important factor, but technology became a decider. However, judging the potential effectiveness of an aircraft at the time was still relatively easy. We had to consider a couple of dozen parameters overall, uh, speed, autonomy, uh, max altitude, armament, uh, protection, this kind of things. Since the parameters were few, then it was still possible to say things like that uh, everything else equal, an aircraft with two more machine guns was, well, you could safely say that it was then better than the other one. The root problem is that our brain is not wired for multivariate optimization. We like to think in a linear scale. This is also the reason behind the fact that in, the, in business we make key performance indicators rather than assessing the raw numbers. There, in economy we have all sorts of indexes to represent a phenomenon. However, with few relatively simple and linear, crucially linear parameters, we can still manage. But when things become more complicated or they are no longer linear, well, we fail. In modern warfare, this linear approach is misleading at best, or utterly wrong at worst. So, we see a lot of videos on YouTube comparing two different pieces of military hardware. Normally the comparison is made on numbers, the few numbers that are known or are estimated, 
This approach has several weaknesses, obviously, but it becomes totally inadequate when we are evaluating or comparing systems. I mean electronic, electromagnetic systems or electro-optic systems. The first consideration is that the information that you can find on these systems, at least on the relatively modern ones that are still in service, is definitely not accurate. The information that you find in the public domain is often an estimate or numbers declared by the manufacturers for marketing reasons and maybe what we know is deliberately wrong. Now figure out for yourself what is going to happen when you're trying to work out the interaction between two unknowns. Yes, it's an order of magnitude bigger unknown. But since we don't like this situation, then we end up using generic categories. Modern, effective, capable, when not the old, plain, good or bad. And sometimes I'm guilty of that too, to be honest. Okay, Altis, how is the Rafale F3 Spectra suit? It is good, sir. And what about the Sukhoi 35? It is good, sir. Very advanced. Is the Sukhoi 35 better or worse than the Rafale? According to the information available, the Su-35 is a bit worse than the Rafale, sir. Please, define a bit. I don't know, sir. This is a very ineffective human way of expressing quality. I just copied it. Okay, let's rephrase it. What exactly is better in the Rafale than in the Suhoi 35? I don't know, sir. Do you want me to connect to the Egyptian Ministry of Defense mainframe to find out? No, stop it! So, despite our liking for this nuanced approach of assessing the effectiveness, when it comes to assessing the effectiveness of electronic system, electronic warfare, radars, threat search and tracks, and this kind of systems, it may well be the case that the nuanced approach doesn't cut it. It may well be the case that one system can make another one completely useless. As it may have happened with the Rafale and the Suhoi 35, a specific feature on a jammer may be capable of making an entire radar useless. On the flip side, if a radar can use a frequency which is completely outside the jammer's frequency band, uh, then the jammer becomes useless. One famous example. During the Yom Kippur War of 1973, Israel based its defense on two pillars. Well, actually three to be honest, but I don't think nukes are relevant in this context. So two pillars, a massive fleet of effective tanks and its modern air force. The tanks were neutralized at least at the beginnings by encountering for the first time in history a massive screen of guided anti-tank weapons. But I'm digressing. The Air Force, after the Egyptian attack through the Suez Canal, tried to attack and confront the uh, Egyptian troops, but they ended up in the operating range of the SA-6 Gainful. The SA-6 was a Soviet surface-to-air uh, missiles that was state-of-the-art at the time. Those weapons took an unexpected heavy toll on the Israeli Air Force. The reason was that the radar warning receivers installed on many Israeli aircraft were not capable of intercepting the uh, guidance emissions of this SA-6 uh, in the Ku band. If the pilot didn't see the missile firing, it had no technology that could help him. The only possible solution in this case was using a rather warning receiver that was capable of working in the coup band. Nothing less would be effective. It was a yes or no situation. Either you can work in the coup band or you can't. An improve a bit better rather warning receiver, but still incapable of working in coup band would not have been a solution. This is a strong non-linearity. This is on and off. This is not, well, if it was maybe a bit better, it could have no. Either yes or no. Non-linear. So, the availability or the lack of a specific technology 
can make a weapon completely useless in modern warfare. This is obviously useful to know beforehand, so that's the reason why the United States, China and Russia invest a lot of efforts and a lot of money in trying to provoke each other in order to better understand the uh, electromagnetic order of battle of the opponents. This is the reason why you see all these reports of confrontations over the Baltic, over the Black Sea, above the China Sea and so on. That's the purpose of doing this kind of activity. And to be honest, it's not just the major partners. The French tend to do this pretty much everywhere in the world. The British have their own initiatives. And to a lesser extent, even my own country, Italy, has this kind of capability that is used and deployed sometimes within uh, the context of NATO operations. However, despite all these activities, nobody really knows what is going to happen if a generalized conflict had to begin. In the first critical hours, when in modern conflict the maximum effort is actually applied, it may well happen that a technology that was fundamental for your plans is not going to work, or at least is not going to work as expected. At the beginning of the hostilities, when all the systems are all clashing together at the same time, you may have several of these situations. The one thing that I'm pretty sure that is going to happen if this generalized conflict between near peers is going to happen is that the plans will go out of the window almost immediately. In one of my previous videos about the F-35, I mentioned the risk of putting all the eggs in one basket. Many European Air Forces, in general many World Air Forces, are going to have the F-35 as the only model in their inventory. And this is very dangerous. Variety is intrinsically a form of protection. In the same way, biodiversity increases the resilience of the ecosystems. Different systems may interact in different ways with different outcomes, particularly if they are based on different working principles. Different weapons with different seekers uh, or uh, different sensors with different sensing technology, everything stuck together, all layered together. This is going to be much more resilient than anything based just on the best possible technology. Standardization is good in a civilian economy. It's definitely not applicable in a military and in a conflict context. A fleet composed by two totally different types of aircraft designed by different people, built in different factories, with different methodologies, using different weapons, different sensors, that require different training from the pilots, is going to be intrinsically more resilient to these surprises. What may be effective against one may not be effective against the other. So I think I made my point, and which kind of conclusion can we draw from this? Well, the conclusion that I would personally draw is that the next time someone asks you if, I don't know, the Eurofighter is better than the Rafale, but just, just don't answer. Yeah, just don't. Or maybe point them to this video. So thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, I'm sure you will love the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please just subscribe and like the video because in this way, YouTube will know that this was an interesting video. Maybe it's going to show this to someone else who is interested. If you could support the channel on Patreon or Subscribestar, you will have my eternal gratitude. In the meanwhile, again, thank you very much for watching and see you the next time.